Good morning. Today, I am pleased to introduce a speaker who is joining us from Jena, Germany. Um, I first encountered Søren's work through a paper he published on Archive entitled On the Equivalence of Forward Mode Automatic Differentiation and Symbolic Differentiation. Uh, this is a somewhat contentious topic in the AD community and Søren helped me clear out many of the cobwebs I had when uh, first studying this topic. And I hope he will share some of those insights with you today. Uh, more recently, he's been studying how to accelerate the computation of higher order and higher rank derivatives using tensor calculus. Uh, this is a recent theme our group has been exploring and uh, he's shown some very exciting speed ups um, for uh, computing Hessians on um, commodity hardware and, uh, and workloads similar to the ones we encounter in machine learning. So this is a um, very interesting development and I hope you'll share some of that, those uh, results with you. Uh, Surin completed his graduate studies at the University of Saarlandes at, and uh, Max Planck Institute he later did his postdoc at the University of Jena, where he now resides as a faculty member and publishes extensively on convex optimization, computational geometry, and automatic differentiation. I hope you will join me in giving a very warm welcome to Søren Lau. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks, Brandon, for the introduction. Also, thanks for the invitation. I am, um, yeah, so... Yeah, I, today I'll be talking about uh, computing derivatives of matrix and tensor expressions. Um, I assume you have some basic knowledge on autodiff, but I'll uh, recap some of the basics as well. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, Brandon already said I'm from the University of Vienna, and I guess that's what most of you are wondering, where is it? And uh, that's a map of Europe. Uh, here you find Germany. And Jena is right in the middle, so halfway between uh, Berlin and Munich. So it's a beautiful place, uh, surrounded by beautiful trees and a uh, uh, nice place for doing research. Okay, so now let's uh, get started with matrix calculus. Um, uh, what's matrix, matrix calculus? Suppose you're given a function f of x equals x transpose ax, just some quadratic function. Um, what you are interested in is computing the first and the second derivative in matrix notation. Um, you usually need this for uh, when you write machine learning solver or optimization solvers for machine learning. Uh, it comes up all over the place. So what you are interested in is a uh, gradient. In this case, it's AX plus A transpose X and the Hessian A plus A transpose. That's what you're looking for. Now, surprising uh, to me and also to uh, many others, there was no general and coherent theory known that would compute exactly uh, um, derivatives of uh, matrix uh, expressions. Um, really, when you look at Wikipedia or the matrix book, cookbook, that's what you usually look first, um, or even at the full book, these sources only contain recipes or lookup tables. So if your function is in there, you're happy. If not, you're lost. And then you would have to do it somehow by hand, uh, not really following algorithm or some intuition. How about software? Mathematica, Maple, TensorFlow, PyTorch, even Teano, if you have a non-scalar output, they all don't uh, cannot perform matrix calculus uh, properly. Um, Exactly. So that's uh, why we were sitting down and came up with the algorithm, um, implemented it and made it online available. So you find it under matrixcalculus.org. Let me show it to you. Um, wait, um, there it is. So you see it. Okay, so there it is. Um, Really, um, right, you have a function f of x equals x transpose ax. Um, in the non-symmetric case, you, it's exactly what, you're, uh, what you just said, ax plus a transpose x. If it's all scalars, you know how to compute this. But if it's a matrices, usually it's a bit of a pain. You can also compute the derivative with respect to a, and you get exactly what you should get, x 
times x transpose, so an outer product. And um, yes, so let's make it a bit more complicated. Suppose the two norm of t minus x transpose times g times x squared. Let's square this. Let's turn off common sub expressions. Um, this is, for instance, um, let's turn this into a symmetric matrix and t maybe as well. OK, so this is uh, if you, for instance, want to embed uh, some data in a hyperbolic space, um, you would have to solve the derivative of this expression. And uh, trust me, it's not a lot of fun if you have to do this by hand. Um, there was even a, a, a course at the machine learning summer school where they would teach you how to do this by hand, but it was more like a, an art than a science. And I've done this uh, a lot of, a lot by hand, and it's awfully frustrating and uh, you always make mistakes. It's annoying. So yeah, or if you're, for instance, have a logistic regression, let's look at this respect to w that's the derivative of logistic regression and pff, or yeah so certainly you do not want to do this by hand okay so that's the service and uh, you can use it let me come back now to the details how does it work? Uh, the details behind. Uh, what before we come to the details, also some of the um, the speed. So on if if you have the gradient. So if your function is a scalar output, um, we're basically as fast as um, PyTorch, Tiano, TensorFlow on the CPU and as well as on the GPU. But uh, there you cannot do much. But uh, when you look, for instance, at the Hessian, so um, then you see a speed up of two or three orders of magnitude over uh, Teano, PyTorch, or TensorFlow. And this basically holds, holds all over the place. The same is for it's just, uh, matrix factorization. This is, um, you can even compress, uh, compress derivatives in the, for the Hessian, and then you see again, two to three orders of speed up. Um, you can even compute the Hessian of a neural net. In this case, it's uh, 10 dense layers. Um, and again, you see two to three orders of uh, speed up over PyTorch and TensorFlow. So that's uh, what I initially said, that PyTorch and TensorFlow really cannot compute it properly. And uh, here you really see it. OK, so let me walk you through the algorithmic details. How does it work? What's underneath? And also, uh, Brandon asked me or allowed me to also give a bit of uh, my personal view on the connection between symbolic and autodiff. And it's a little bit, yes, so a bit on the symbolic and uh, differentiation and automatic differentiation. What's the difference? And um, yeah, so let me walk you through an example to illustrate the difference. And um, suppose we were now in the scalar case, just for introduction, we're in the scalar case. So A is scalars and those are all scalar functions. So let's just look, how would you compute the derivative of this function? F of A log of sine of A squared. So DF DA, that's how we learn it in high school, right? It's the first is, um, you compute the derivative of log, which is one over what is ever in there, one over sine a squared times the derivative of cos uh, of sine, that's cosine, times the derivative of two a uh, of a squared, that's two a. That's how you learn it in high school. That's what we basically know by symbolic differentiation. Okay, what you can do is you can now translate this function into a computation graph. Um, basically, you, you see what I mean in a second. So you have A, let's evaluate this function. A, what we do next is we square it. So A, then we square it. Then we take the sign, and after this, you take the logarithm, and out you get F. So it's a computation graph. Um, so what we did in a forward pass, we uh, computed the, we evaluated it. 
Now let's look how did we compute the derivative. First, we computed the derivative of log. After this, we computed the derivative of sine. And after this, we computed the derivative of a squared. So actually, computing the derivative, we went backwards through this computation graph. So um, backward pass. And what I've just shown you is basically reverse mode auto diff or backprop, however you call it. So let's make it a little bit more concrete. Um, let's introduce um, uh, sub expressions. So we compute a squared, we call this S1, sub expression one, and then we run, uh, evaluate the sign. So that's S2. And then we take the log, that's F. And now let's compute the derivative again. So what we did is we took the log, the first compute the log, the derivative of log is one over the input, one over S2. Let's just write it here. Then we compute the derivative of sine. The derivative of this is cosine of whatever goes in. And then the derivative of squared, that is 2a, whatever goes in there. That's it, right? So exactly. So what we've just seen is a back prop. And this somehow miraculously, like 1 over s2, multiply everything along. That's this. Cosine s1, that's exactly this. And multiply by 2a, that's exactly this. So forward, you evaluate. Backward, mul uh, multiply everything together you get the derivative. And that's backprop or remorse, reverse mode autodiff. That's it. So, um, so basically, you see whatever we did in the symbolic case kind of uh, is roughly the same in the autodiff world. So let's look at one more example. And um, that is, um, suppose we have log of sine of a times b. How would we compute here the derivative? Log is again one over sine AB. Sine uh, derivative is cosine. And then now we compute with respect to A. So that's times B. And the very same for B, again, the outer, then cosine, and then the derivative of this, that's A. That's how we would run it in high school. That's how we learned it. Very same thing now in the auto diff world. First, evaluate, forward pass, and remember all the uh, common sub-expressions, the internal states. So a times b is s1. Then you take the sine is s2. Out you get f. Reverse, uh, backward pass, compute the derivative. Again, log, it's 1 over s2. Then sine, it's the cosine. And now we, can, we have to split with respect to a. That is the other thing, that's b. We write b and a times b, the derivative with respect to b, it's the other thing, it's a. Write it there. And uh, that's the um, autodiff word. And what we do is now we multiply everything together. So uh, if you want to compute the derivative of f with respect to a, it's 1 over s2 times cosine s1 times b. It's exactly what we did here, the very same thing. And with respect to b, this times this times a, it's exactly this one. So even if you have multiple um, input variables, you can uh, compute the derivative with, to all variables in one pass. And basically what you're doing is the very same as you are doing in the symbolic world. And that is, and that's about that's uh, all what I wanted to say about uh, symbolic and automatic, uh, auto, well, autodiff. They're basically the same when you allow common sub expressions in symbolic differentiation. And that's what you usually do. Um, right? We've just seen what we did, and it's exactly the same. And now I have to issue a warning that's my personal view. There is, as Brenton said, there's a bit of a debate in the um, in the autodiff community, and usually what you read, um, there is the common claim that they are different. 
there's often the common claim that you hear symbolic differentiation suffers from expression spell. And that's why they say automatic differentiation is uh, more efficient. Um, that's really not true. If you allow common sub expression exactly what we just did, they are totally equivalent. But uh, yes, it, it's more of a philosophical issue here. But algorithmically, there the, you just do it the same. You just seen it. Okay. So uh, yeah, um, if you have any questions or any comments, please feel feel please feel free to interrupt me. I'm very happy to answer uh, any questions uh, now or um, later after the talk. But uh, yeah, you can just interrupt me at any time. So often you read it's uh, they are different. Um, I, I beg for a different opinion. Okay, so this is now uh, all I wanted to say for auto diff and symbolic diff. They're basically the same, so you can interchange it. And what we actually do is, um, let's turn to the matrix case. How to uh, now compute uh, run uh, um, differentiation on matrix expressions. So what we have is, um, let's just look at this uh, function. That's a neural net, a one layer. So what we have is, that's our input x. Let's draw the computation graph. Um, it's x. You multiply it with uh, w. That is your weights matrices. You add the bias term, then you take a nonlinear nonlinear function. In this case, sigmoid function. Uh, now it's the output, um, the labels, you minus y, and you square it just to get some loss function there. And um, yes. So how would we do it in this case? It's um, again we evaluate the whole thing. So you um, write down the common sub expressions. And now in reverse, you compute the derivative. So the squared, uh, the norm squared is now two times S4. And uh, minus, it's either one or minus one, depending on wh what you have. The sigmoid function is um, sigmoid um, multiplied by one minus sigmoid, whatever is in there, times whatever uh, comes out. So you have to remember where to multiply it. Um, addition is again, one, one. And uh, now here multiplication, it's the other thing, x times. And here it's this times w transpose. Now it's again, as in the scalar case, very same thing, except now in the matrix case, you have to remember, in a scalar case, everything, uh, multiplication is uh, commutative. So you only have one type of multiplication, so you don't need to write it. Um, now we have to multiply everything together. And now in the matrix case, you have totally different types of multiplications. Um, you can multiply it element-wise, because we take the sigmoid function element-wise on each element in your vector, you also have to multiply it element-wise, the, the der derivative. And here it's a vector matrix product. So you have to, again, remember where you write the multiply. It's x times, and in this case, times w transpose. So you also have to transpose it and remember where to, on, on which side, from which side you have to multiply it. Of course, it's not commutative. And this is the annoying part in when you uh, multiply over, when you solve the whole thing in, for, for matrices. So now derivative with respect to W, so down here it's 2S4, um, that's this one, element wise um, with this, and now X times, so it's really X times whatever is down here, times once we can ignore, and with respect to B it's, this times this times S4, it's this one. With respect to X, it would be the whole thing times W transpose. Okay, and here's S2 and so So this is basically the whole picture if for when you uh, compute derivatives over matrices or, or over matrix expressions. 
And what we actually prefer to work on is to work on the computation graph, um, makes your life a little bit easier, but it's really equivalent if you do it here. So take home message here is that it's actually matrix case is identical to the scalar case, except for the type of multiplications in the derivative. This, and this is where actually all the trouble comes from in the matrix calculus. It's uh, you have quite a lot of uh, uh, types of multiplications and you really need to know which one to put there. And um, yeah, so let's make this a little bit more, um, let's resolve this issue. Because I just told you, write this here and uh, you have to believe me now Let's, I, I want to give you a little bit of a proof uh, or a concept how to, where these multiplications come from. What? So if you use matrix notation, exactly what we just did, uh, you end up with, unfortunately, 25 different types of matrix multiplications that you need only for the linear matrix case. And um, now you can still deal with this. But now if you, you, you want to um, compute again the derivative of this, so you would need to compute, you would need to know the derivative of these 24 types again, the whole thing will blow up. It really will blow up and actually it does. So it's, uh, I was working on this for a few years and it gave me really headaches. And uh, I was not the only one, uh, quite a number of other people also worked on this and um, you just end up in a mess. It's awful. Uh, actually, it did even lead to a buggy implementation in SymPy. So this is really not the right way to do this. Um, what we have to do is you have to leave matrix notation and go to tensor notation. Then things become much easier. And this is the whole trick. Um, you need higher order tensors and Ritchie notation is really precise. And I'll introduce Ritchie notation to you in a second. Um, Cause um, yeah, so here's the whole deal why. If you have, for instance, F of X, then uh, equals X transpose, and this is a valid function. And you once in a while you need to compute the derivative of this. This for instance, if you have X transpose AX then you would have to compute here derivative. So surprisingly, it's in, uh, in Ritchie notation, it's this uh, tensor, but it's not the identity matrix. And this is the, yeah, this is a bit of a tricky issue here. F of X equals X, the um, derivative there is the identity matrix. But if you transpose it, it's not the identity matrix anymore. And let me give you, um, a bit of a small introduction to Ritchie notation. So I'll show you two algorithmic approaches. First Ritchie notation, then the other on generalized Einstein notation. Um, that's how you can solve the whole thing. So first Ritchie notation. Um, I assume you have not used it. I also haven't used it before, but it's very precise. So if you have a scalar, it's just A. Um, for vectors, you just give it one index and one upper index i. For transpose, you give it one lower index. That's how it is. Matrices, matrices basically has two dimensions. So it gets an upper and a lower index. It has one, that's how it is. An identity matrix is the delta tensor. It's one upper, one lower, i, j. This is, there, there's a, basically a very mechanic translation. And I think for you, it's just fine now to look at this. That's all you need to know for now. Um, it's a mechanic translation. So, and you can have um, all sorts of tensors. So this is a, a rank or a order two tensor. It, had, it has two dimensions, basically like a matrix, but it's really not a matrix. Matrix has one upper and one lower. Those are uh, details. You don't need to understand them for now. You don't need to know them. We'll uh, get to this later. It's just very precise, or it's a fourth order tensor. So it basically, it's uh, for computer scientists, it's like a fourth, um, an array of four dimensions, four dimensional array. 
so I've seen Brandon was giving a, a talk on uh, um, introductory talk on auto diff. So um, where he mentioned this as well, it's like a third or four dimensional um, array. Okay, now um, how does Ritchie notation work? Um, you can basically write it together and then AX, you just have to match the indices over which you're summing. So A times X, you sum over the J. So this is uh, why you have to match the J. This is an outer product. Uh, that's a scalar product, YJ, XJ, you sum over and then it cancels out. And uh, then you, you're left with no index. So out you get a scalar and Y transpose X is exactly a scalar. Um, you can also multiply element wise X times Y. So that's element wise. And if you're, if they're on the same level, you don't cancel them. Um, exactly. Or for instance, A times diag X. So what you do is you multiply element uh, column wise. So what is left is at the very end of this expression, I and J, because J is on the very same level, so you, it doesn't cancel out. Um, yeah, that, that, that's for now. So all I want to say is in Ritchie notation, you can basically, whatever you do in matrix notation, you can also do in Ritchie notation. Um, and the multiplication you basically encode in the indices. Now the whole night or the nice, the very nice thing is, and that's what, what makes it really nice. It's commutative. It's really commutative. You can flip it, um, X and A and X. And uh, because the indices tell you what the outcome will be and how you multiply it. And exactly now we're back to the scalar case. In scalar case, um, that was also commutative. And uh, basically now you can actually use this notation, run backward uh, differentiation or reverse mode auto diff, and you are there. So let's apply this to this example. Um, so gradient of f of x transpose ax, first translate this into Ricci notation. It's x i, of course it's a transpose, a i j x j. Whatever appears up and down gets canceled. X, so the J gets canceled and the I gets canceled. So all the indices are canceled. At the very end, you have a scalar. This is certainly a scalar. So that's the mechanic translation into Ricci notation. Let's draw the um, computation graph that we had before. It's XJ. We first change it to XI because we need the I, then we transpose it multiply it with a i j that's this part and then we multiply it with x j that's this so this formula is really exactly this okay now what we do is well we just name it um, the notes we just uh, write down the common sub expressions and the derivatives the derivatives as we did before in the backward pass we just write it on the arcs Right, um, so multiplication is always the other thing. So here we multiply, for instance, for this node, we multiply x0 times v2. What's the derivative? Here it's x0 and on the other arc, it's the other thing, v2. So it's really very mechanical. Let's look at this again, let's look at this. It's a multiplication, v, the node v2, it's a multiplication. It's v1 times x1. So what do we write on the arcs? Exactly the other thing, v1 and x1. That is the derivative rule for multiplication. Um, here it's delta ii, um, just take it for now. And here it's a change in the, um, in the, in the indices. So that's you multiply it xj times delta ij is exactly xi. So you have to watch out for the indices. That's it. If you don't really understand the details with the indices, just leave it for now. Um, 
I hope you get the rough, I, I just want you to get the rough idea that's basically the very same as you're doing in the scalar case. Okay, so now let's run reverse mode. So what we have is respect to x. So it's x0 times x1 times delta ii times delta ij plus v2. This is what you do in reverse mode auto diff. You multiply along the arcs and sum everything up that goes in here. Okay, that's the derivative. All we need to do is plug in the uh, sub expression. So x0 is x0 is xj, right? This is this. What was x1? x1 is aij delta ii, we leave, and then let me see what's here. And then v2 is xi times aij, that is v2. Okay, and now um, since it's commutative, we can flip this, so for better readability. And um, what we do now is we just translate this back into matrix notation. This is nothing else but AX, delta II is just a change in the uh, delta II. This means we transpose the whole thing. Delta IJ is just changing the indices. And this again is, what's this? This is X transpose A. X, this is, this I cancels here. So it is X times A. Um, I understand that this is, might be a little bit fast with the um, indices and with the notation. Um, but I want to convince you that it's really mechanical process. You don't need to think anything. You can really code this as a as an algorithm. Okay, so that's it, right? That's the solution. It's a x. Wait, it's a x transpose plus x transpose a, and uh, that's exactly what we had earlier. Okay, and this is really what uh, the website is running, Matrix Calculus. It's running exactly this. It's all doing this for you. So you don't need to worry and do this by hand. If you want, you can do this by hand, but uh, I would not recommend doing it. Okay, so what we have is we have Ritchie notation for Matrix Calculus and um, it's very precise and it differentiates between upper and lower indices. So between covariant and contravariance of a vector. And that is basically, it differentiates between X and X transpose. It's mathematically, it's, this, is a, an, this is actually an element of the dual space. Um, the physics people need this. If you're very precise in mathematics, you also care for this. And um, this is really nice, it's precise, but often you don't need this precision. In, especially in machine learning and computer science, um, we don't care if it's X or X transpose. All we care for is it's uh, a vector it, or if it's a matrix. If, uh, if we have it in, for instance, in NumPy, you have a vector in NumPy, really an ND array, you transpose it, you get out the very same thing. So my take home message is, if you care for the differences of X and X transpose, you need to stick to this notation. If you do not care for this, things become a bit easier. And now we are in generalized Einstein notation. Let me give you a, a bit of an idea. So we don't distinguish between upper and lower indices anymore. All we say is a tensor is a D-dimensional array. That's it. It uh, vector is a one-dimensional array, a matrix is a two-dimensional array, and so on. Basically, as you uh, compute in, as you use NumPy, as you're computing, or PyTorch, or whatever, or Teano. Okay. So let's use this. And um, now we again care for the tensor and the matrix multiplications. So um, what you now do is you specify, you have a tensor A and a tensor B, and you specify it's, um, 
um, its indices as uh, index set S1 and uh, the index set of uh, B as S2 and the index set of uh, C as S3. And um, for all of you that um, basically um, are used to NumPy, that program in NumPy, it's basically what you would write in einsum, uh, the, the einsum um, command. It's the very same thing. In the einsum command, you also specify S1, S2, and S3. Input, other input, and what comes out. And here you specify the indices, if you want to have an I, a J, or whatever. In this way, you can um, both indices that appear here and uh, that don't appear in the output, you just sum over. And that's it. And with this, you can basically write down any multiplication of tensors that you can think of. Uh, matrix multiplication, um, element-wise uh, multiplication, or vector matrix, or whatever. You can really um, write it in such a form. And that's it. Um, I'm getting, yes. OK, do you, do you... sorry. Uh, yeah, yes, just yes. A, a quick question here. Yeah, sure. um, do, do you run into any uh, issues? You, you mentioned earlier that um, sometimes things commute and sometimes things things don't um, always commute like you'd like. So if you're taking like higher order um, derivatives here, do, do you have to keep track of the order that you evaluate um, these or, or is there any com complications for higher order um, derivatives? Actually, no, no, no. That's the beauty of it. Um, you don't need to tra take track of this at all. You can run forward mode, backward mode, and actually, it doesn't matter what um, if it is if it's a higher order derivative. That's the whole thing. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me come back to this question later again. Let me uh, let, let me finish the um, Einstein notation algorithm. That's really just two formulas, and then we're done. And then I can go a bit into the details and answer your question, um, and uh, p uh, point out the difference. So this is if you have this multiplication symbol, and um, you can c encode anything you want, then um, the, the forward mode autodiff it's exactly this, the derivative turns into this, where S4 is the new index set of um, dx. So all, just take it for now. Um, that's what you have to write on the arc. That's this multiplication symbol. Um, you will not have a chance now to see that this is correct. You just have to believe me for now. All I want to show you is that this is for the forward mode and for the out, uh, for the reverse mode, you have to write this multiplication symbol at the arc, and that's it. And now the nice thing is, I don't care what kind of multiplication that was, it's, it, it works for any multiplication, and you always write exactly this thing there, no matter what the multiplication was. And you write this thing there for the reverse mode, and that's it. So it's basically one rule for forward mode, one rule for reverse mode, and not, as we have seen, 24 types of multiplications in the matrix. Uh, it's just this one, and that's it. And uh, just maybe to incorporate also your question, may maybe I, I get to your question back uh, later, later. So this is for the multiplication, and if you have a, um, a, un uh, um, a function, then you have to write in the forward mode this multiplication symbol, and in the reverse mode, you just write this multiplication symbol, and that's it. Um, don't try to understand now what this means. It's just, uh, again, you write this, that's it. You do it very mechanically, believe me, and uh, that's it. And this is basically the whole algorithm. Um, you can run forward. Uh, um, auto diff or reverse mode auto diff as we have seen it in the scalar case and that's what you write at the arcs and that's it and this is the whole algorithm so let me just sum up 
um, the Einstein notation. So um, really, you don't care. It, it, basically, you view a, vac um, a, a tensor just as a multidimensional array, as we do in NumPy TensorFlow. You can use it for, for forward and reverse mode auto diff. Um, I haven't talked about this. Basically, that's enough for you need for you to need to know. Um, if you want to get a really good speed up or high efficiency, you need to combine forward and reverse mode. Uh, that's what uh, auto diff people call cross country mode, and then you really get the highest efficiency. But this is only like uh, you get a few factors out, but not a few orders of. Uh, so, this is just a a little bit of a benefit, but uh, not much. You get actually really the speed out of using this. And uh, yeah, and that's it. So let me sum up the whole talk. Um, yeah, wh what I've been talking about, symbolic and automatic differentiation. Basically, from my point of view, and I hope I could convince you at least a little bit, they are basically the same. We've seen an example, yeah. Um, the next intuition was if you now go for matrix and tensor calculus, linear algebra notation is not the right language for matrix and tensor calculus. This is really, I had to learn it the hard way and many others as well. Um, first the approach was based on Ritchie notation. It's really precise. Um, we published it at uh, NeurIPS uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. It works, it's really precise. It once in a while gives you a bit of a headache with the indices, the upper and the lower indices. If you don't care for this, as we do in um, usually in uh, machine learning, go for a generalized Einstein notation. That's what you also use in NumPy. And then we published it at uh, AAAI last year, the algorithm. And it really just boils down. I've just shown you the whole algorithm. It's these two lines. And that's all you need to know. And yeah, it's really simple, it's general, and it's efficient. And if you want, you can, yeah, you can use it uh, online. Uh, you don't need to do it by hand yourself. And this is really the, the mechanics underneath. So basically, this finishes my talk. And I'm uh, happy to answer your questions. And um, uh, Brandon, you just had one question. Let me answer your question really quick. Um, again, so I can give you an um, the yeah. Wait, let me go back to one slide, and that is where we had the this one. And um, so here, uh, that is again. This is a matrix case neural net one layer output. The output is a scalar, and if the output is a scalar. PyTorch, TensorFlow, Teano, they can cope with it. They can run reverse mode auto diff and they can cope with it. And um, exactly. So then they are very efficient. But if the output is not a scalar, they, they cannot cope with it anymore. And all the functions and formulas I've shown you don't care what the output is or what the input is. And actually, and, and so, so this really works on anything, also on higher order derivatives. You just run it again or on your Jacobians. I mean, I've also seen you were talking about Jacobians. So if this would be a Jacobian, um, again, the same algorithm works. And to point to the very difference is, let me go here. That's the whole difference. It's um, S5 is the new index set for the FDF. If, if, if it's a scalar, S5 disappears. And that's why TensorFlow and PyTorch actually work because they, they, they don't have the S5 in there. That's the whole difference. And that is why uh, they work, but that's why they fail in the general case. I see, okay, uh, thanks. So that's, um, that is, that up. That's a, yes. I, I uh, wasn't aware, um, uh, of uh, of this this uh, this different distinction between uh, Einstein no notation and uh, the the Ricci uh, notation. So this is really very um, I think the really right level of uh, um, 
it, for, for, for our audience, I, I mean, for, for me at least, I, I enjoyed, uh, it was very accessible, I thought. Um, if we could uh, un un unmute ourselves, po if possible, and uh, g give a, um, a warm round of applause to, to Saren for a great talk. I, I also have a question, uh, if we still have some time. Sure, sure, sure. So um, go ahead. Sure, sure, Omar. Okay, uh, thank you for your very, very interesting talk. So I, I had a question because I'm interested in computing uh, derivatives of matrix functions. So uh, not functions defined in an element-wise fashion, the functions you can define with the Taylor series, for example. So like the matrix exponential, uh, yes. these kinds of functions. Are you able to also do these um, or is, is it different? No, actually, so matrix. Let me, because um, you just said matrix exponential. Let me, sh so first answer, they work exactly the same. It works exactly the same. All you need to know is you need to know what is the derivative of your matrix function. This you have to somehow uh, supply. So for matrix exponential, I have actually no clue what the derivative is. Oh, it's actually, it's again the matrix exponential, right? Times, I have no clue what the derivative is. Um, I can, uh, for instance, are you happy with the, uh, with the determinant? Is that also, uh, um, it doesn't, inverse, inverse. Inverse is a matrix uh, function, right? Yes, inverse is yes. Uh, inverse, yes. Um, Yes, the inverse is actually, so the problem is I don't recall. Let me go to, um, the, the problem is I don't remember what the derivative of the inverse is. Um, but it actually, inverse of x. Okay, so it's, the problem is it's actually a fourth order tensor. Yes. In, in, in Ritchie notation and also in Einstein notation, you can represent it. Um, it's the inverse times the inverse, but uh, in a, I, I would have to now think a little bit how the, how the indices are, how to, how to write the indices. I can look it up and give it to you somewhere, but it actually, it works exactly the same way. You just have to watch out for the indices, and uh, yeah, and this okay. and the whole algorithm works again. So you can just plug it in, um, exactly. Okay, okay. Because for some of the matrix functions, uh, computing the derivative is actually a bit tricky. So you you can compute the trace of the derivative. Uh, that's that's not too yeah. difficult, but the actual computing the actual derivative of the function is trickier than uh, you computing. You know the derivative of a function of a function of a real number because of these non-commutative. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. 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 So, may I have no idea? I don't think it's in the paper. Uh, maybe I could. Yeah. Yes. But you, yeah, you're you're right. You're right. You ha really have to watch out with the non-commutative. But uh, if you stick to Einstein notation or Ricci notation, it uh, you can write it down as is, and that's it. You just have to yeah. know and watch out a little bit for the indices. I would always recommend Einstein notation. Really, rich notation is a bit of a pain if you don't care for transposes or so. And uh, yeah. Perfect, thank you. So, yes. Uh, um, I, I, I know uh, we, we had a, a presentation um, uh, about uh, different types of n n notation um, that, that you can do for this um, uh, this, type, this tensor calculus, I, and I know Jacob is here. I was wondering if he, he um, uh, had or you had any comments about um, the, these these other graphical notations and how they fit in um, to to or how how you how you see you know there, there's uh, um, some some different innovations in LaTeX for how to how to render these. Um, here you're, it looks like you're mostly interested in source code. Is, is that right? Um, so, so I think you're a bit referring to um, tensor networks or, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, perhaps, uh, I, I know that, that um, uh, 
there, there are some, some different rent ways of rendering these. Um, and I was curious if you had any uh, thoughts about for, for the pedagogical uh, purposes or, um, or what, uh, uh, what would you find most, um, here, here this is a lot, very symbolic uh, kind of language. I'm, some other people are more visual learners. Um, just curious if you, if you had any opinions about that. Yes, yes. So I would actually, um, yeah, you, you can use tensor networks. I barely use them. I never use, hardly ever use them. Um, I prefer really this notation um, that I've shown you with the graph and uh, where it's just right. That's somehow what you're also used in when you have a machine learning background, that's what you usually use, right? When you have um, TensorFlow and to depict the computation graph, that's what you get out actually. And uh, yeah, it's very I, close to the source code. That's what I like about. Um, yes, yes, yes. And it's also because um, when you write, I mean, uh, initially I never liked ein, ein sum in NumPy. I had a bit of a trouble using it or I didn't like it. And now I love it. So once you're getting used to this, then this is um, the natural way to, to write things down and I, also the natural way to think. So um, that's why I prefer this notation. And that's also what you basically have when you look at source code and uh, what the machine learners usually use. I do know that the physics people love the other notation a bit more. They, they really stick to... Um, tensor networks and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay, so. yeah, interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and you mentioned uh, towards the end about, um, about uh, mixing the evaluation. I, I'm, I'm just curious, so in this interface that you sh you've shown, um, this is, uh, is this just source code transformation or um, are, you, are you doing um, so some uh, evaluation and then simplification and then evaluation? Or, or um, can, can you just comment on um, um, I, or, order of evaluation here, or is it just sticking to symbolic um, differentiation in this in this demo? In in this demo, you mean the online uh, demo here? So uh, yes. yes, yes, yes. So actually, I can. T so it, I, c I can show you exactly what's happening. It's um, wait. It's really, it's really exactly this. That's, that's really what's happening. It's really this, it's, uh, wait, let me make this a bit smaller. So I see. It's really, um, it's really this. So first you have this as an input, you generate the expression graph, which is straightforward. Then uh, you just write, really everything symbolically so you don't evaluate anything because you don't have any data but i mean you can run it symbolically right write down everything like this and then multiply in the reverse mode so we're using reverse mode auto diff or symbolic diff however you want to call it and then you get out the result and you perform uh, some simplification so for instance multiplying by one gets uh, simplified um constant folding, a few simplifications that are multiplication with identity matrices also get uh, di disappear. Yeah. So that's basically what's underneath a bunch of simplifications as well, but everything on symbolic level. And um, I seriously, you can call it symbolic differentiation or automatic differentiation. It's actually the same. Some people agree on this issue. The literature often disagrees. I don't care, seriously. Yeah, um, well, I, that's, that's, uh, that's very, very nice how, how you're able to generate um, the source code as well for importing this into other frameworks. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, you, you, you really get the source code out. You can uh, run it on, you, you get a Python code out as well. Because I mean, this you can just directly translate into NumPy code. Um, and uh, which is somehow beneficial because I always uh, mess it up when you write it. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, are there any, any other questions from the audience? Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so, so I want to say, first of all, um, thanks for the presentation. This was really, really clear. I, I kind of wanted to ask questions in the middle, but all of everything was so clear that I didn't have anything particular that was um, like, okay. you know, big question marks. But one of the things I wanted to ask, um, so you had mentioned the, uh, the concept of tensor networks sort of spurred on, like Brendan mentioned that. And I would agree that the, the notation for that is very, very similar to sort of the computational graph that you get. Um, you know, it's also very similar to like Einstein summation notation or a different flavor of it is uh, similar to, to the Ricci uh, notation. Yes. But I think the one, the one thing that's kind of interesting and, and I wanted to ask about is the fact that when you go from say like a, a Ricci style notation to a computational graph, um, that's sort of a choice that you make maybe for efficiency purposes, um, you know, maybe for other purposes like parallelism or things like that. But there are many, many ways of sort of um, compiling a, you know, an underlying network of contractions as specified by, um, you know, like an Einstein expression or, you know, Ricci calculus uh, expression into a particular computational graph. And I wanted to ask if, if there are any situations you could imagine where in the process of doing uh, back propagation, uh, you know, or, or more generally doing any sort of automatic di um, differentiation, if there are any settings in which it would make sense to use sort of a different computational graph for the back propagation compared to the ones that you use for the forward propagation. Uh, like, like in other words, if, if the process of automatic differentiation, if there was any interesting interplay that you could imagine between the compilation step of taking the, you know, the sort of global expression, compiling it into a series of binary operations, you know, and the process of taking the derivative with respect to all those binary uh, operations, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah, okay, okay. So, yes, yes, yes. You specifically mentioned binary operations, and you're right. You can have um, higher order operations, um, ternary operations, and so. And there you have a choice of uh, how you multiply your, or how you, yes. And this choice um, is really um, crucial for efficiency. Um, yes. And um, yes, and however you, yes. So the first thing is this, uh, the first, this is crucial for efficiency once you um, fixed, uh, fixed an order of uh, how you perform the contractions, then you basically have a computation graph and then you can run your um, derivatives on this, compute derivatives, mm -hmm. and then everything is fixed. Um, I really had never, I never had to deal with these, with these things, with these issues, uh, but I know um, the order makes a huge difference in efficiency. And uh, yes, so you have to watch out for this. It really makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to mention it because this whole like yeah. one way of thinking about, you know, what you sort of uh, gain by going from a particular computational graph to sort of the broader expression yes. uh, that, you know, it's um, it comes from is that you can sort of think of this broader expression as like a whole family of different computational graphs. And, and it's sort of a family that's generated by, certain rewriting rules. Like when you have the matrix multiplication, you know, ABC or something like that, you know, there's yes. different ways of, of representing yes, yes, yes. that. And so I, I guess I just wanted to mention that one yes, thing that yes. I've been thinking about, and I, I just curious, I don't know, to see uh, from the perspective of someone in this, just, yeah, just keeping in mind that there's different ways of rewriting that maybe in some cases that could help with the auto diff or something, but. Um, Yes, 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 yes. Actually, actually, um, so what you mentioned, there's, yes, yes, this, um, okay, I can say my personal view on this is, um, I'm a bit lazy. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you have to turn this into a, into a binary operations and one, the user, once the user has turned it into binary operations, there's no choice for me anymore for performing the der derivative. Um, but you're right, um, if, you, if you're given this input, then you uh, have to watch out for this. Um, just for efficiency, Chris, you just said, um, since we're efficient, see, um, when you have higher order derivatives, so when your output is not a scalar, when your output is a scalar, 
backward uh, uh, back prop or backward or reverse mode auto diff will always be efficient. If the output is not a scalar anymore, it will not. You can still improve. And this is then you really have to uh, do other things. You have to use cross country mode. I just wanted to emphasize this as well here. So um, just as a side remark, um, exactly. So um, scalar output, TensorFlow, PyTorch, everything is fine. It's efficient, it works. If it's non-scalar, you have to do a few more other things as well. Cool, thank you. Great, yeah. Um, I, uh, I guess, are, are there any other questions in the audience? If not, I have one more question and then um, um, maybe uh, we, could, we could wrap it up um, after that. Th thanks for the good questions in the good audience. Um, okay, okay, yeah, uh, this is, um, okay, so I, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, uh, m memory um, uh, efficiency, and uh, I know um, one thing uh, that um, some people care about is, uh, is, is sparsity. Um, so um, I, I, I was wondering if, if you have any uh, thoughts about um, lay, layout or, um, because I, I know one thing that people have um, expressed their concern about is the, um, uh, the, compl the complexity as in space of storing the entire graph if you have a very large um, computation graph. And here, if we're doing source code transformation, um, maybe uh, this is taking care of us for the from the compiler, or if you're jitting. Or maybe this is um, something that uh, you, ha you have to worry about uh, if you're accumulating a very long um, chain or a large graph. So um, it, 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 I know you've done experiments on different commodity hardware and uh, different workloads um, for, uh, for, for this, this kind of acceleration. Um, and uh, I'm curious if you have any, any um, comments about, uh, about hardware and, and memory efficiency and, uh, and that, that angle. Uh, thanks. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, uh, first of all, um, okay, talking about efficiency and hardware and uh, JIT compilation. So, one thing that um, um, that 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 it's really important on the GPU that you uh, that you really. Um, glue these things properly together, um, the derivative as well. Because, um, yes, so, 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 um, because um, there, um, due to the latency and uh, a few other issues, you can lose a lot, um, you can lose a lot of performance. So there's uh, some projects on how to do this efficiently. Um, I think I don't um, I don't re recall the project yet. I think Facebook has the project on how to transform these graphs and how to uh, manipulate this to become to get it uh, really efficient on the GPU. On the CPU, you don't have so much issues there because um, they are really pff, you don't care so much. But on the GPU, you see these issues. And um, Exactly. The second thing is for space requirements. If your graph is really long, as you said, you have to keep everything in main memory, all the um, all the intermediate results, and uh, this can be a very limiting factor. And what sometimes is being done is uh, you um, do something like a checkpointing, where you um, don't uh, re uh, um, where you don't uh, keep all the intermediate results, but you recompute them again in when you compute the derivative. Um, exactly. So this is also what you can do. So that's called checkpointing just to uh, deal with the, with the memory issue. On the CPU, you basically don't have so many, much issues. If you have enough memory, also speed doesn't have, then you don't really have a problem. I see. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, cl clearing that up because I, I know you're very concerned with computing the exact uh, symbolic representation of, of the derivative. And then um, so some folks say uh, 
they're, they're concerned about um, maybe just approximating uh, uh, if it has some, some sparsity structure uh, on, on these, um, these matrices, you know, maybe you could just uh, look at uh, block sparse kind of uh, derivatives and uh, maybe that's something that um, the compiler can take care of for your users, um, you know, as they uh, read this expression and translate it to their, um, their, their uh, favorite framework. But um, this is, yeah, this is very uh, exciting work. I, I think um, uh, it's, it's it, the usability aspect and uh, interpretability aspect, and it makes it very appealing. So um, I'm glad uh, you, you had took the time to, to share that with us. And I know that there's um, some other folks who, who will be very curious. So we'll put uh, your contact details about uh, all of this and uh, hopefully the slides, if we can um, uh, get, get them after. Um, and uh, I'll send you. I'll send you all the um, the details about that. I'll stop sure, the recording sure. here. Um, thanks.